afternoon. I call this meeting to order. It's the Board of Trustees Facility Committee meeting. Um, I'd like to welcome um, our board members who are on the committee, um, Mr. Eddie Garcia, who's a board, who's a member of the committee. Uh, Dr. Prissy Roca Tipton had a previous engage engagement today. She's our vice chair. Uh, I also would like to welcome Jessica Gonzalez, uh, Denise Garza, and Minerva Pena from the board. Uh, the committee goal is to provide and maintain adequate facilities in order to support ongoing uh, academic progress. Um, Ms. Gonzalez, would you lead us in the pledges, please? I'll call on our superintendent, Dr. Renee Gutierrez, to provide our opening remarks to the, today's meeting. Thank you, board members of the facilities committee meeting. Uh, we have uh, some updates to give you on some uh, ongoing projects that we have, and then uh, we are going to discuss and give you some updates as well as uh, some proposed items that we have. And um, we are going to be looking at current projects and, uh, and projects that we've completed uh, based on uh, previous funding that we've had. But uh, one of the things that uh, we're looking forward to is utilizing the ESSER three monies that uh, we're going to be receiving. And uh, we have some proposed uh, items to discuss that uh, we need to consider for under ESSER three so that we can upgrade our facilities, such as improving our HVAC systems and the air quality. But we'll talk more in those about those items based on our ESSER funding that uh, we will be receiving hopefully by the beginning of the fall semester since the application I've said it before is due on um, July the 27th and then right after that I'm sure we're going to hear about uh, our uh, ESSER funding but right now we're working on the plan and in the plan uh, besides closing the instructional gaps that we've talked a lot about is also uh, improving our facilities and, and that is also being considered in our plan as we're developing it in with different committees and getting input from different stakeholders. And those are the presentations and discussions that we're going to have with the committee. And more to come because of the monies that uh, we're going to be receiving and, and putting out a good plan so that uh, when we submit it and sometime in July, um, but for sure by the 27th, is that uh, it's a plan that, uh, that covers a lot with facilities that will be allowable under ESSER funds. Um, some of them uh, may not, some of them will be, and uh, obviously we're going to be working with those that uh, we, they're going to allow us to improve our facilities through the ESSER funding, and this will give us a tremendous opportunity to improve a lot of our uh, facilities instruction in classrooms, as well as our campuses and, and the air quality and the HVAC systems and those kinds of things that uh, we believe are going to be allowed under the federal funding that we are receiving. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cantu. We have a PowerPoint presentation. It's going to be up on screen for everyone to follow. And, uh, and that way we can uh, follow up on our agenda on each of the facility items that we have. Go ahead, Dr. Cantu. Everyone has a copy of it as well. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, Madam Chair, and distinguished board members. It's my pleasure to come before you today and share some updates on, on uh, the facilities and what we're working on. If you will uh, look at page two, Dr. Gutierrez went briefly over the agenda, so I'm going to just uh, go on and get started with the presentation, and we're going to begin with the ongoing projects. One of the most popular items that we are working on is the SAM Stadium, and this is the improvements that we needed to do. And one of the things that I've asked our facilities team is to give us a timeline. And one of the things that you'll notice on the top left-hand corner, you have, for example, the abatement and demolition and as-built survey. All those are at 100 percent. There are some co there is some coordination that needs to happen with PUB because of the elec the power lines are going to be run underground and with the city of Brownsville. We ran into some challenges, as you know this was the middle of the pandemic so getting permits delayed us but uh, we are you see a timeline there you can see the uh, picture on the right side where the demolition has been completed we're excited that this project is moving forward and there you're actually able to see some of the demolition already 
The next item that is also very popular, and this is one that's very, very uh, important, Dr. especially uh, for uh, any Dr. questions on SAMS. Anybody want to say anything <coughs> about SAM stating? Okay. Um, the only thing I want to say is it did seem like it took forever, and then all of a sudden it was done. So um, I would drive by, and it seemed like we'd see those old buildings, and then one day it was all it was all gone. So, is there a um, pretty much in plans that by August we'll see some things done in terms of parking and fencing and things like that? If we review the the timeline that's listed here, Ms. Brown, on this page here, you'll notice that we have the bid advertisements going on uh, beginning in August and the second bid advertisement on August 8th. And one of the things that is important to remember is that we have to advertise two consecutive Sundays. That bidding process is approximately 45 days. So having said that, the pre-bid uh, proposal would be August the 10th. We'll receive the bids on Wednesday, August the 18th. The awarding of the construction uh, contract would be August 25th. So uh, commencing the construction, uh, it's uh, an allocation of about 240 days beginning on, on August 27th. So you, there will be some things going on behind the scenes. It will be more of the paperwork and making sure that the procurement process is followed. Thank you. The only thing I want to say yes. is that we're going to be, I believe we're going to have a full football season and with spectators like back to normal. Just uh, uh, on the construction side, that uh, whoever is going to be doing the work to fence it off, you know, well enough where, it, you know, safety-wise, so that there's no issues with safety, people trying to cut through th that area which is under construction, and and somebody may get hurt. Just that we provide uh, some uh, safety fencing all around the construction site because uh, football season is going to kick off uh, till about November, and then plus we have other events like track and. And, and other field events that we do there in, in the, at the stadium. Yes, sir. That's a great point, and we'll, that has been noted. Thank you. The next item that we have is uh, one that's very important, especially for our elementary campus. This has to do with the mini gyms. Uh, as you know, this board approved that we uh, have HVAC, restrooms, and office additions to all our elementary campuses. We've divided the groups, the campuses, into three groups. Group one and group two are listed there. And you can see that the completion for group one will be in December. So that is super great news because we have that construction that's visible already for our, our community to see it at the first 10 campuses. The second group would uh, be completed in March of 2022. You can see some of the work that's already been done. There's a layout on the top right-hand corner where you can see that the gym um, is that top portion, the square, and then you see the addition on the side on the bottom where you have offices and you have restrooms and you also have um, the, the storage area for each uh, elementary gym. Excellent work because I'm, I'm thrilled to see the elementaries get these multi-purpose buildings. This is wonderful. Thank you, ma'am. The next area that we're working on right now has to uh, do with a, yes, sir. Would be this be able to, can we cover some of this with ESSER funds? Just, uh, just a thought, because we're just in the starting the project and, <coughs> and, and maybe this uh, mini gyms, since we use some of our local funds, perhaps. I think it's an area we can explore. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez, uh, we do have uh, okay. some recommendations for the mini gyms uh, uh, later in the presentation. Yeah, I just thought about it. It just crossed my mind. I don't want to forget. That maybe we can consider if it's allowable. We're on it, sir. Yes. The next item is the food services and nutrition uh, freezer refrigeration storage building. And uh, this last this month, if you will recall, the engineering services was approved. Uh, the testing and the survey and the borings have been completed. Uh, the design was designed in-house by our architect and it has been completed. The project completion will be in March of 2022nd. So you can see in this visual here the freezer that will be added, the additional space. And it's important to note one of the findings that we had in the FNS building is that there was not enough uh, restroom facilities. And so they have included it in the uh, engineering services. Hopefully once we get it back we will know if the funding is available for the restrooms. But it's a huge need in that facility considering the number of employees that we have there. It's excellent. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
The next area is one uh, was recommended by one of our board members, and I will just mention that there was a concern at Pullum Elementary and the b new bus, the bus canopy, and the concern was that every time it rained and students were getting uh, uh, in line to go to the bus, that they would get uh, soaked, literally. And so one of the things that uh, the facilities team has done is designed uh, you can see the design there it's going to cost about sixty thousand dollars to do this canopy but this funding is not necessary we're not requesting funding because we will use allocated funds that we have to complete this canopy at Pullum. Ms. Pena this is the item that you had specifically brought to our attention. I'm excited to hear that there's some progress but what is the date more or less you think that's the one in the, on the 22 of March or December are these after? What are the dates for that one? I'm going to uh, defer to Ms. This, this after we, we receive materials, it should take about six weeks to build. And, th and that's and the reason I say that because there's a little problem with delivery of, st of, of metal right now. And so we're hoping that that doesn't take as long. So the order has been placed. We're just waiting on material to get it started. Is that what I'm yes, hearing you say? Uh -huh. Uh, the the uh, the the person the uh, contractor is ready to go on this, but he would have to order the materials, and that's that's where you know we don't want we want to be optimistic, but right now materials taking a little bit longer. As soon as he gets them, in six weeks they'll be constructed. The operative word that I heard you say is after he orders the material. So when do we find out when he's actually going to place the order? I believe we talked about Mr. Noah said that the total time is a 12, deli 12 week delivery time, yes, uh -huh. if I'm correct, beginning uh, now. So we're looking at 12 weeks. Worst case scenario, that's getting the material on time. Yes. So hopefully at the beginning of the next school year Same and maybe right. before the fall semester is over? June, July. I, I would say s September, late September, something like that. Great. Thank you. At least we have some kind of ball for our figure to figure it out yeah. and hopefully we'll have a wonderful non-hurricane season in Brunson. But I think we're all aware that there's a big supply chain issue on everything now but I'm I'm certain this team will do it as quickly as they can. We all understand there's a need at Pullum. The next item that I want to give you an update on the school bus fueling station this is one that we had not discussed before, but this is uh, what we're calling an urgent need. What we found is that the current diesel t tanks that we have in the district are very old. Uh, we have one tank that was uh, is 35 years old and a second tank that is 30 years old. Uh, and due to the age of the tanks, it has been very difficult to uh, secure insurance for our tanks, our underground tanks. And one of the things that uh, Mr. Garza and the employee benefits uh, mentioned to me is that the only way we got insurance this year was by assuring them that we would address the tank issue, how old they were for the upcoming school year. So I do want to thank Mr. Garza for uh, negotiating and securing them. So they propose the proposal is to secure a one uh, a 20 thousand gallon tank and it would be above ground. I do want to inform this uh, board that we had our facilities team visit several school districts. They visited four school districts to see how they do this and so the proposal is to do it above ground. It is in compliance with um, uh, all standards that are in place. It's going to cost about f approximately 500000 We have worked with our uh, CFO to make to secure this funding because, again, it is an urgent need. Um, and this cost or this replacement would, um, is going to suffice for the next 30 years. So we're excited to take care of that. This, there's been a lot of teamwork from the facilities and transportation and our employee benefits. And you will see a timeline there at the bottom. You see that uh, the concept development began in April. Uh, we uh, got the board approval for engineering services in June, and we are presenting it at the facilities committee meeting now, and we are moving forward, and our goal is to have this completed by February of 2022. Well, our own homes, we have to replace things, so I don't think we have any choice here on this one. Thank you, ma'am. The next slide is a picture of what this new tank location you can see. It's just a, a drawing. It's an aerial view of the old tanks where they're located underground and where the new tanks will be located. And like I said, our goal is to finish February of 2022. 
it's just some pictures there. Good. The next area Question. is one. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Penny. Yeah. So they're going to move towards the back of the facility as opposed to now being closer to the front? Is that what I'm seeing? Because the, the old tanks, they're closer to the entrance. Am I correct? So now we're just going to move them to the back? Uh, yes, ma'am. I think that's excellent. That's a very good idea. Thank you so much for that. Oh, um, who was first? Okay. Ms. Gonzalez? A uh, quick question. I noticed that the new tank is, is on the location where buses are parked. Uh, we're still good with bus parking in that area? Yes, ma'am. That has been evaluated. Thank you. Mr. Garcia. My only concern there, the location is uh, the proximity to the water. Should we have any type of leak? Uh, that could be a major concern. Can we move it up like same line but away from the water line, the resaca? It there, there is not any flooding issues at that location. We have about uh, about 90 feet of space to put it in. And uh, it, that the re the one of the reasons why it's in the back because of the lines of the buses. It's just facility that they, they turn in and they come right back out. It really works well with the circulation. But uh, as far as uh, uh, there's a big um, like curb or a, uh, that, that outlines that area and there's no concern about buses going off that edge or anything like that. It's not about buses. It's uh, just in case there's a, a, a leak of some kind, oh. an overflow, and uh, we'll be in deep trouble. So uh, I was looking more towards the west mm -hmm. uh, away, and uh, you know that that's my only concern, the proximity to the water. Once it gets into the water, we're going to have a major problem. One of, one of the things that we're designing into this facility is a is a container so if the case there's any kind of a spill it's not going to go outside of that container and it's it's a it's actually a three foot wall that goes around the actual tank for and that's for in case of any spills good uh, yeah th that i've been seeing at uh, major containers mm -hmm. when you travel on 37 you see those uh retaining walls which uh definitely will help but yes make sure we do have that I also think <laughs> would like to just add, Mr. Garcia, the fact that it will, it will be above ground will help us if in the event that there's a leak, that we can uh, quickly see that if there's a leak uh, because it is above ground. When it's below ground, it's very difficult to f see the leak. So I think that that will also be helpful. Right. And that uh, retaining wall will definitely help. Okay. Good. Thank you. The next item that you have here is one that we have talked about, and um, this is the Bestato middle, middle School Second Story Egress. And what this is, well you have a picture here of a door that is, this is uh, a classroom wing. It's one exit for students. It's on the second floor. And there's a serious safety concern here in the event that students need to evacuate from the second story, they would be going through that single door. So the, the whole purpose of this is to make sure that we uh, open that egress and the structural engineering has been completed. It needed to be completed because there's some uh, support walls there that needed to get done. The goal is to finish this work before the end of the school year. So it'll be open, expanding that opening and just to make sure that if stu in the event of an emergency, students are able to exit quickly. That sounds good. The next project that our facilities team is working on is the LED lighting. And one of the things that we're doing is we talked about the first three campuses and we're looking at replacing the lighting um, to LED. And one we hope these three campuses, what we're doing is a comprehensive evaluation. It's not just necessarily changing the light bulbs or changing just the balance. It's actually looking at the wiring, making sure that it is comprehensive in nature. You can see the square footage that is at each campus. Once these three campuses are done, then we're able to identify the, the following campuses that we can expand to for LED lighting. But this is moving forward and we are anticipating to finish this work by December. Good. And if I may, I want to thank Ms. everyone Penny. who's working on this LED lighting because it really has a thing to with your eyesight. People don't realize, especially when you're on the computer all day long and we're going to that. So I want to thank you because the importance of that bright light really helps our students' vision because that does wear it down and before you know it, 
you can see us by or as properly as you can. So thank you for staying on that. And we get and with time we're going to get the whole district on that. Am I correct, Dr. Gutierrez? So thank you for bringing that up and staying on it. The next item is some good news to share. I know that for a while there was a lot of different things go happening at the aquatic center, but as far as facilities concerned, 100% complete, and we wanted to bring that up. So great job to our facilities team. I'm so glad to see this facility back up and running. It's really important to our community. The next item that we have is Canales Elementary School improvements, and um, I did I welcome our principal that joined us this afternoon also. Um, we you can see the pank, the parking lot looks just beautiful. It is 100% complete. The roofing is almost complete. The canopies have been completed. The demolition, if you will recall, there was a lot of demolition happening. It's been completed. We are going to bring some portables because they're needed in that area. Now, if you notice on the bottom section of the slide, you see a proposed development. And one of the things that we were approached was a very creative idea. There have been no promises made, and I want to make that clear. However, one of the things that have been proposed is to look at possibly building an outdoor amphitheater and where students would actually be able to hold class outside. There is space to do this. Uh, have some gardens there, uh, have some uh, recycling projects, just have a lot of events for the kids to be actively involved. Now, the amphitheater, we may be able to include it in the ESSER funding. I don't want to say it with 100% certainty because it will require any construction out of ESSER 3 will require approval from the state of Texas. But this is an idea. We think it's creative. And I promised the team that I would include it in here to just share a thought. And as we consider, as we get more clarification on the ESSER 3 and if we get approval, this may be something we can do and not only make it available for one campus, but other campuses that could go and visit and it would be an outdoor amphitheater for instructional purposes. Ms. Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I've had the pleasure to visit this campus uh, to uh, look at the facilities. I, at one point years ago I was a, a Canales parent so it's amazing at how this this campus has turned around. My only concern, especially with the demolition that has been happening, is there plans for a privacy fence? Because you can see everything from the neighbors next door. I'm so glad you asked that, Ms. Gonzalez, because we do have a grant that was awarded to the district with our security department, and there is fencing included. So there will be some new fencing that will be going up at Gonzalez. Perfect, thank you. And I have a question on portables so we're going to relocate portables over there how many i believe it's four classrooms mr noas am i correct uh and those are to be used as classrooms oh okay okay sure can you come to the mic please yeah, come on up Uh, that would be our art, our music. We have a couple of special ed classes. We're going to have our parent center out there and possibly one other special ed. We need four to six okay. just to be on the safe side. But uh, everything will be utilized for the kids outside. Anybody else? Okay. The next area that we have here is the Veterans Early College High School Stadium. As you notice, um, we've been talking about the ticket booth and we did get a, an approval at the last board meeting to proceed. There will be a decorative iron brick fence, uh, gates and vinyl coating chain link. Um, that is rolling. We are expecting completion by December of 2021. We love this idea because that's going to give us a whole secondary stadium now because Sam's beautiful as it is, it just can't hold everything. And always the idea was that veterans would be a secondary stadium for use for all kinds of district events. So this is a, we completed the facilities and the projects that they're currently working on. I'd like to transition over to the, our maintenance department and the work that they're doing. Um, in the maintenance department, um, in preparation for our students to return, we did purchase and install the new uh, soap dispensers at every campus, and we wanted to make sure this was in place because, as we know, the pandemic continues. There was also some um, pro team backpack vacuum cleaners. This were purchased and distributed district-wide, and it, 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 the whole intent of that was to increase productivity. 
the phones and GPS, phase one, uh, the radios were upgraded with a GPS system also on the vehicles. So it's, we're able to see the efficiency, to evaluate efficiency on going from one campus to another. Um, this board also approved a concrete leveling equipment. It has been used for sidewalks and walkways that are uh, broken or uh, not leveled. And so that has saved some money to the district. Uh, there's still an additional $3.5 million in, dollars in projects that have been completed. That's uh, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and so forth. 90% um, of the work orders that have been submitted to the maintenance department have been completed. So a lot of work happening in our maintenance department. And one of the areas that they do mention to me that they get constant repairs is our HVAC uh, due to the age of the equipment. I don't know if my colleagues have had a chance to see the new fencing in a lot of the schools. It's stunning. It looks really, it, it really enhances the look of the school. I, I really like it. I think maintenance does a great job. They've done a lot of a lot of upgrades to our campuses. The next area, um, we wanted to bring you an update on the energy and water consulting projects. And one, I'd like to just remind everyone that there was four areas or analysis that were completed. We looked at billing errors, uh, tariff changes, rate discounts, and load transfers. This is what our consultant, Mr. Driggers, has been working on. And one of the things that um, in the next slide, you can see that there was some billing errors that were found. Uh, Magic Valley was not providing a primary meter discount of the 3% at the Palo Alto serv Support Services. I did ask where was the Palo Alto Support Services, and that is in the maintenance area. I did know that, so it's in the maintenance area. And so that, that discount was not there, so it has been refunded to the district. There was some overcharges on uh, from Magic Valley, and those have been resolved. There's some uh, improper charges regarding to special minimums, um, and they were not able to justify that, and they removed that. So we do have a little bit of savings that we're seeing already. But if you look at the next slide, you can see that there's eight, the seven. It's actually seven campuses because we combined the two. Um, but it's a total of eight. And so the projected savings with some of the changes that we're already seeing, the refunds and the meters and so forth, we're anticipating 7,000. But I do want to share that uh, one of the things that we've um, been challenged with, and it's on the next slide, um, one of the things that we've been challenged with is completing the paperwork to transfer the schools from PUB to AEP. One of the things that we're doing is we have the procurement process that's running, meaning that, yes, we're going to change to AEP, but we've got a choice now of the cooperatives for the power, which company we're going to use. But one of the challenges that we see here is um, that there's three cooperatives that we have, a, uh, we have an option to select for the provider of power. Uh, PUB has delayed giving us the exit cost from um, in order so that we can pay those exit costs and transfer them to AEP. In speaking to our uh, energy, our consultant, Mr. Driggers, I want to tell you that he has been sending emails constantly to PUB. We have a deadline that we have given them by Friday because we've been pushing and pushing a little on this. And we had a conference call this week and stated that it was important that we get this information as soon as possible. The longer we wait, the longer, you know, the fees can change. So we're trying to get the exit fees from PUB. There is a discussion. Um, PUB is stating that we need to pay for the equipment, that uh, their equipment, and uh, the contract, our energy consultant has clarified that we do not have to pay for equipment. It's just the exit fees to leave PUB. So there's been some challenges there. We have a deadline of Friday. The next step is going to be uh, uh, involve our legal counsel to help us if we are not able to get those exit fees by Friday. That's the deadline. Ms. Pena. Question. Because in our name, we wanted to go, let's say, from, I'm not going to name the company, so I won't, from company A to company B. Got to get it cheaper with B. Company A owns the polls. Company A owns all the lines. Company A is charging us $10,000 so we can pay for the new poll for company B. We went through legal. We're responsible. They own the poll. They own the lines. So they don't have to allow company B to come and hook up to their poll, their lines, so I can get a better rate. 
So let's look at that because sometimes in the long run at $10,000, you end up paying a lot more money than you're going to be saving in electrical because they own the actual light pole and all the wiring to it. So let's make sure that when we do make these changes and they do say, wait a minute, that's our equipment. We're not going to allow company B to come and hook up to what we paid unless you pay for a new pole. So the company B made it real easy. We'll pay the 10000 and we'll go put you a new pole. You know what? N never mind. Let's, let's just work. So make sure that even though our attorney says, no, you don't have to, make sure the legality is correct. Otherwise, we might be between a rock and our hot spot, uh, at hard spot, and we don't really know what to do. But check on that, because I know that does exist, because they own the equipment. Thank you, Ms. Peña. And we're One fortunate because we have this consultant, and he's very well versed. And I think this whole thing can be wrapped up by saying breaking up is hard to do. Yes. Th thank you, Ms. Uh, Brown. And, and you're one of the things that does help us, and Ms. Brown, I think I had shared this with you previously, is that there is a contract that specifically stated, now this contract's old, but that the equipment was not going to be, we would not have to pay for equipment fees. So th there is some binding document that we have, and that's where our consultant, who's uh, you know very strong in negotiating, is moving forward with that. Ms. Pena. Yes, and in that contract, make sure that when it says you don't have to pay for the fee as long as you get the light from me. So you follow what I'm saying? Make sure you read that properly because they're not going to charge you the equipment because we're furnishing the electrical power. But once you go on another company, that changes that statement in that part of the contract. So we need to be very careful how it's written. Please. Thank you. So the next steps on that next slide has to do with we're going to continue the procurement process, the delay we talked about, and if necessary, the deadline is this Friday. If necessary, then we'll look at sending a, a memo that is official through our legal counsel. The next step is um, this board also approved intercom projects, and this is something that is incredibly important, especially when there's an ur a urgent situation and it needs to be communicated to the entire campus. If you will recall, Vermilion was a campus that was an urgent need, and so uh, f the f maintenance department kicked in with their funding and they purchased the equipment. They're at 95% complete. And if you notice at each campus that I listed here, the six campuses, I, I made a note that it's a comprehensive replacement. That comprehensive replacement includes the devices, the speakers, the wiring, and the controls. Some of these campuses that are very old, it's not a matter of just taking an intercon system and replacing it and leaving the old wire there. The entire wiring needs to be redone. So those are comprehensive replacements. You can see that it's moving along. It is on target with our days. We were uh, allocate or we allocated 540 days. I do not think it's going to, uh, I think we're gonna meet the deadline er uh, earlier than February of 2023, but I just wanted to provide you an update with the progress as we're moving forward at these uh, six schools. Well, this is clearly a safety issue, so we need to do everything we can to move it along. I know that there's been a lot of conversation about repairing bleachers and improving our playing fields, and there's some things that we can do uh, quickly. And that what I've asked the maintenance department is to evaluate the work that's needed in the repair of the bleachers, fencing, and lighting. And so those are things that can easily be done. So they are prioritizing the campuses with greater need. The plan is that after July 1st, with a new allocation, we will begin addressing the repairs. The goal is to kind of provide a facelift to the bleachers and playing fields at all our middle and high schools. So you should see some things, um, just that facelift at these campuses um, after July 1st. Excellent, we really need that too. The next area, um, we are super excited about this and I know that several of you uh, attended the ribbon cutting for our first campus, the play and park playground structures. We have, I, I'm really happy to report that out of the 23 campuses, we've completed 13. You can see some pictures there. Uh, we're very excited. Our elementary kids are, are using these facilities and they're very happy to use them. So uh, I just wanna thank the board because this work is moving forward. Dr. Kuntu, now this isn't being paid for out of local funds, is that correct? This is coming out of a different pot? This is coming out, I'm gonna ask Mr. Lopez to remind me. It's a Title IV, thank you. Okay, good, thank yes. you. Yes, 
Thank you, Mr. Lopez. This was, uh, thank you for reminding me, he re did remind me. This is the one that we uh, asked TA for approval and we used it with the idea that it would help our students with health and for their health and keep them fit. So we did get approval out of Title IV. Excellent. Ms. Garza. Dr. Gantu, um, these are actual pictures that we already have at some of our campuses? Yes, ma'am. Okay, because I don't see the, the ramp or any way for a wheelchair to be easily maneuvered in that playground. I don't know if it's the angle of the pictures that they were taken, but every, every um, playground structure does have a ramp and it's also labeled with a handicap accessibility. Now, one of the things that we talked about is that I don't know, I'm, I'm sure it's not the correct word, that mulch that's being used. Uh, with time, it will be compressed and it will be easier to get a wheelchair in there with time. But because it's fairly new and it's not compacted, uh, it, the student will need help from a wheelchair. Mr. Lopez, if you'll address, the, use the microphone. You can use Mr. Robledo's or mine over here. Good afternoon, everyone, board members, board president. Uh, every playground has an access ramp. Unfortunately, yes, you're correct. The angle of the picture does not reflect the ramp, but every single one, as per design, has a ADA compliant uh, ramp access. And then the actual uh, playground has uh, an access um, device so that they can trans transfer device so they can transfer from the wheelchair to the playground. And it's um, engineering wood fiber, the mulch. The mulch, <laughs> engineering wood fiber, thank you. Thank you. So the next item is one that's a really big area for us and um, with the direction from our superintendent, there's been a lot of conversation on recommendations for improving air quality. As we know, ESSER 3, um, Part B, uh, number eight, is an allowable expense. And I'm gonna read what it actually, what the language that TEA uses. This money can be used for the inspection, the testing, maintenance, repair, replacement, and upgrade projects to improve the indoor air quality in school facilities. That could be filtering, purification, and other cleaning fans and control systems. So if you notice, there is repairs, there's replacements, there's upgrades. So construction costs, uh, anything that we do in construction, we do know TA has informed us that we will need to secure prior approval. So what I'd like to share is the plan of what we're going to do at BISD. We're dividing it into two phases. Phase one is to improve the air quality. And phase one is one that many districts, and in fact, TSC also used, is what is called a bipolar ionization kit. What that does, it addresses filtration and purification. And I put some, some, some information on what this ionization technology does. It's, it's used in the HVAC systems. It generates a positive and a negative charge particle. It provides a data to demonstrate efficacy. It removes the virus, including the SARS and the COVID virus from the air. And it also facilitates disinfection. I do have a picture of a sample equipment. I need to make very clear that at this time we're going through the procurement process. So I'm not recommending or advertising for any. I just wanted to give an idea as to what this unit looks like. Um, you can see the dates there on June the 4th through June the 9th. Uh, we sent the specifications out and we also specified exactly how many we needed in our district. I want to commend our facilities and our maintenance team because they did all the legwork of identifying. It's based on the tons that we have of AC. And um, so they had to identify how many tons we have in our district. And then from there, look at how many of these units we needed. On June 9th, we will open the quote. We are using a cooperative and we will be submitting this recommendation to our superintendent and senior leadership. So this is what we're calling phase one, and it is a bipolar ionization kits that many of our districts are doing also. Yes, ma'am. Two, on this, um, so these are add-ons to the, the systems that we have already on, like would there be one of these add-ons per unit? 
uh, what I have been informed, I've learned quite a bit now of these uh, <laughs> this kits. Um, each kit uh, is sustainable for every 12 tons of, of AC that we have or HVAC. So one of these will, it, each campus is it's going to have a different number based on the number of ton or the weight, the tonnage that we have on the HVAC. So you will have some campuses that will need more because the tonnage is more. And so, so it's a, a roughly a, a formula of 12 um, tons you, for each every 12 tons you need one of these units and oh. it is in the HVAC system we're going to go through the whiteboard oh, I'm sorry. we're going through the by board to get some quotes on this that is correct sir okay we want to make it clear that that's how we're going to approach this that we're going through the by board getting three quotes and getting the best value for the district so that we're all on the same page Yes, and I'm going to ask Mr. Robla, remind me, you also talked about Edgar and there was two components that ESSER is requiring us to follow. So whenever we buy um, items of construction through these federal grants, it kicks in other requirements for us. So um, I know everyone laughed when I, pre when I talked about Edgar, but Edgar is actually a, a purchasing manual that we use, not a person, um, but in there, especially when you, when you buy construction, there's two things that we talk about. We talk about Buy American, and then the other piece is the, for us to follow the Davis-Bacon Act. And really that deal goes back to making sure that, um, that the contractors pay their employees uh, a livable wage. And so there's a lot more that goes behind that, but those things are now being brought up when we do these type of projects. And so, uh, which will be part of the specs, and um, we, just, we just make sure that they comply, the contractors. And just to clarify what Dr. Gutierrez mentioned, uh, we have three cooperatives that offer this, and so we've asked them to for quotes. We'll receive the quotes uh, on June the 9th. At that time, we'll know which is the best price, and we'll proceed uh, to move forward with this. I could see adding these to our, our newer units, but do they make them where they've got units that have these already built in so that when we're purchasing, we're replacing old units, we, we purchase something that already has this component there? One of the things that I was, uh, good question, Ms. Brown. One of the things that I asked was, uh, we know that we're going to have to replace some units. And the question was, can we use this, ion, this kit with a new unit? And the answer was yes. So it will not go to waste. What we will do is we will, if we're going to replace a unit, we will use these ionization kits for the new systems also. Do these kits have like filters and things that have to be upgraded or replaced? Or, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Um, they do not have filters, Ms. Brown. Uh, there is one of the things that we're in, we included in the specs uh, that we're getting quotes right now is we want our maintenance staff, our HVAC technicians, we have seven, we want them trained on and making sure that they're uh, looking at them and if, they're, if there's some sort of a problem that they're able to problem solve. So part of the specifications that we submitted is training for our HVAC staff, but there is no filters to replace. It is a kit that is attached to the HVAC system. Okay, I wanna continue with trying to stump Dr. Cantu here. Okay, how does this all interact with the chiller system? There are two different systems, Ms. Brown. Uh, from my understanding, this kit that you see here is not for a chiller, it's for the regular HVAC. There's a different kit that applies for a chiller, and so the bids are specified to, for, to address both uh, in our district. Good job, Dr. Kent. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm having more questions. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Good job. She's learned a lot. The, this ionization kit is to start with the improving the air quality immediately uh, when we start school in August. And, and most of the districts are moving in, do and moving in this direction, doing this first, because the HVAC replacement, that's the long-term solution. And it's going to take time. But this will already start us off uh, starting the year, hopefully, that uh, we can have these kits in place and start improving the air quality in every classroom. And then HVACs are the next long term for replacement because those are going to take some engineering, design plans, and then taking everything out with the old systems and putting a brand new system with air ventilation and everything else that will take a lot longer to get done. Question. Mr. Mr. Garcia. Now, 
how did we come about or who gave us the recommendations as far as uh, what we should be looking at, whether it be the ionization, the uh, blue ultraviolet lights. Uh, I know we're already using the filter since that's uh, totally separate, the HEPA 13s. So where did we get these recommendations? One of the things that we did, um, Mr. Garcia, is we started checking with uh, our neighboring district to see, we wanted to see what is out there. Uh, we did not want to go with the approach of, of looking at a specific company we said okay let's check to see what is other what are other districts doing one of the most recent conversations was with uh, TSC operations and they talked about how uh, the ionization kits they do remove the virus and one of the things that we're focused on is improving the air quality so there are other options but our option was what can we do immediately once you know securing quotes and so forth and ensure that we provide improve the air quality and remove the virus so this is how uh, by getting ideas uh, with our neighboring districts this is how we came up with and then researching our on our own we also looked at what does it do and what it, you know how does this install how you know what's the wear and tear of it so those were the areas that we looked at uh, some of the research and then some from our neighboring districts did we pay any engineering services uh, for this item no we have not paid any engineering services what we did is we did have an engineer originally look at um, how many tons we had in the district and so forth so there isn't an engineer study that was done but not specifically on how many units that was done internally and who did that part? The engineering? Uh, internally. Internally, it was a combination of Mr. Lopez uh, spearheading this along with Mr. Uh, Inojosa. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Gonzalez. Oh, Ms. Pena, I'm sorry. You were next. No, I just want to make sure that people understand when we put these ionization kits, it's really exciting to know that what they don't only remove the virus, the pollen from the air and all those allergies where kids have the runny eye, all of that will be removed also, which is a big plus because allergy season comes in and it makes it really difficult for some of our students. So I'm excited because it removes everything else that hurts you know, people with allergies, not just your uh, COVID-19, which is a big plus that gets rid of the virus, but your everyday stuff that we should have worked on getting rid of years ago. I'm glad it's going to come in and take care of that. Ms. Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, I've actually seen commercials on this to add it to your house, so that's just very interesting. My question is, what's the lifespan on them? Okay, that one. Um, uh, three years. Thank it's you. Three years. I, I almost got her. I almost got her. <laughs> three years. Keep it up, guys. <laughs> well, I, and I just want to reiterate for our parents that are watching, uh, I think that uh, the comment that has been made by several of you is that we are going to improve our air quality and it will be safe for our students coming back for face-to-face -face instruction. So I think that's very important for this community to know that BISD is prioritizing this and we're moving fast on this. Mr. Garcia. You want to explain also the reason why we're not going to be doing the portable units, how, that it's more effective and more efficient to work with the HPACs as opposed to the uh, portable units that some districts are using? Yes, we, we did consider some of the portable units for each classroom. And in order, what when we looked into that, we looked at the, spec at the specs for each air filter. And in order to get the quality of filter that we needed that is portable, there's some maintenance that it's included. And we were concerned about district-wide individual units. It, and, and so when we looked at, okay, what is it that we want to do? We want to improve air quality. We want to help remove the virus. We want to make sure that we're disinfecting surfaces. We, the, the, the upkeep, the ionization kits will do what we are asking of the portable units, but the portable units would include some maintenance that we wouldn't be able to keep up with that maintenance. It would be a continuous maintenance as opposed to the uh, ionization search standalone no need we already have the filtration at being added so no need for those portable units that is correct sir. thank you so dr gutierrez talked about 
uh, phase two briefly. So phase one is the ionization kits that we're going through the procurement process. Phase two is we're continuing to improve the air quality and uh, we want to make sure that we look at the repairs and replacements, uh, upgrades of the ventilation and HVAC units. So one of the things that our maintenance team has already done is d completed an inventory of how old our units are and what are the things that, that we are uh, needing to possibly replace uh, or uh, upgrade. So we have that list that we're working on. We're hoping to finalize that pretty quickly with our facilities team. This is a, a team effort. And so that as soon as we're ready to move into phase two, we've got the data ready and we're ready to go on that. It's going to be a lot of work on the replacement of our HVACs. About how many campuses are right now are like in life support of priority? Um, no? I, I do have a report on that data. And uh, Mr. Lopez, would you like to share that, please? If you can join us over here in the microphone. Just so that because uh, there, I know that there's you have a lot a of there's a great need. Just okay. What we did is we prepared the maintenance department. We prepared a comprehensive assessment on the HVAC equipment based on the age of the equipment, meaning the date it was installed, and uh, the tonnage, the model, and the location. So right now, uh, we did priority one, which is need to be replaced within the next two years. Priority, or now, right? Now and within two years. Priority two, within five years, priority three, within 10 years. And priority one involves about 47% of the district. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Um, wow. Lopez, I knew you had this data. You're welcome. So this stimulus money is a real good opportunity for us yeah. to replace equipment we need to replace. It is a great opportunity. The next item is one that we brought, uh, or I would like to introduce to the, the board, is to centralize our technology department. And one of the things that I'd like to highlight is we, the technology offices are located in five buildings in the district at this time. Unintentionally, there's fragmentation because we've got people sitting at different locations. So what we would like to do is to create a state-of-the-art technology center we think it, we believe it will improve productivity um, because all the offices will be in one location and they will not be working into silos. Avoid the duplication of efforts. And I included a picture. One of the things that we do not have at BISD, and we are the largest district south of San Antonio, and one of the things that we do not have are training facilities for BISD. So what we would like to do is create a technology center where we can have uh, rooms with uh, laptops, uh, uh, pro uh, projectors, and screens available for presentations, not only for staff, but if we needed to bring some students. With the pandemic, we've had to introduce different software programs, and training uh, is been done either virtual or, uh, through, I mean, mainly through uh, Teams meetings. So this would give an opportunity for teachers to actually go to a training center and have a state-of-the-art facility for training purposes. This would convert Resaca Elementary. The recommendation is to convert Resaca Elementary into a BISD technology center. We believe that we are able to submit this request using some ESSER funding because we can tie it to the fact that there's more training required. Now there's so, many, so much technology need across the district, so much technology training. We, we have, for example, the most recent cases is, are the SEL, the social and emotional learning software. And so there's going to need to be training. So this would give us an opportunity to have a training center. Uh, this is something that most districts have across the district. And we're, this is an opportunity that we believe, again, pending approval. We don't know if, if, if it will be approved, but uh, we would like to propose that we have a technology center for the district. What are the five sites? I know there's the building down the street here, and I know there's the third floor. What are the other sites? I'm going to ask Mr. Fisher, Mr. Nichols to help me with that. Ms. Brown, good afternoon. Um, 
not necessarily do we have all those sites like you just mentioned in one location for humans but we have redundant sites throughout the district that we have for our, our network as well so we have things that will go on over at the cab we have things that are we've got storage for a lot of equipment that we have at cab we have over here we've got it on the third floor and we've got a bunch of stuff on the second floor that we main and house uh, equipment there as well Additionally, personnel we have over at uh, Eagle Drive in the portable buildings. We've got one, two, three labs over there with an extra lab that we have that houses humans in there as well. And training goes on. Well, not in the last year. I can't tell you that it happened every day. But prior to the pandemic, we had trainings in there every day, and we needed to schedule those. So, Robert, are you proposing that we pull the mainframe off the third floor and relocate that to Rosaka? Is that what you're saying? We, we have that ability to do so, yes, ma'am. It's going to take a lot of time for us to think it through, to engineer it out, the circuits that we have coming this way, uh, to relocate the fiber. It's going to take some time. I, I won't tell you no, but it can be done. But is that what you're proposing? Is that what you want to do? It, it would be nice to put everybody in one location, yes, ma'am. Uh, whether Rosaka, Rosaka or wherever the board would, would feel as though that most advantageous place for us to go to be unified, um, we'll... We've never really had a home except for where we're at now. So anything that Dr. Cantu, Dr. Gutierrez, this board can provide the technology department of the BISD, we have our palms up and we're ready to dig in. Would Rosaka work for you? If, if that's the offer that was placed for us, we will make it a home. One of the other things I'd like to add, Ms. Brown, those are great questions. One of the other thing is that I visited our facilities here uh, off of Price Road, and if you have not had a chance to visit, I would encourage you to. Um, this department is completely outgrown the facilities. Um, I am concerned of, of possible uh, safety concerns there. Um, I see some of you nodding, those of you that have visited. Um, there's some safety concerns uh, and we had uh, not too long ago I'm gonna say uh, sometime during the year I don't remember the date but we did have a, a pipe that broke and we had a water leakage and we have those m major frames that are for the entire district that water was very close of getting to those frames if they had done that we w our district would have sit down for students so I was very concerned about that. So if you have not had a chance to visit, you would know exactly what I'm talking about, that they just have outgrown that facility. And I would like to see all the departments come together and then have a state-of-the-art facility that our district this size deserves. I, I support putting it all in one place, and certainly the technology department has supported. I mean, during the pandemic, you all certainly exhibited your abilities and it probably would have been easier all the things you had to do if everybody had been in one place I just want to make sure Rosaka is the best place I mean we don't have a lot of places available but if that'll work I, I'm not opposed Miss Pena and I agree I need to, I think it's a good idea to have everybody at the same place and make sure you look at everything because it's very difficult when you have them spread out and you have people working and I know because when I worked for the state of Texas one time uh, we had some old equipment, I'm sure you know about, that belong according to people in the Smithsonian Institution. So the young kid that came to replace the older gentleman to fix us, messed it up and shut us down for seven days. Because like you said, getting the water and shutting down, it, it, technology is very delicate. And if you don't do it right, you can turn around and crash the system. And it takes a while to bring it back up. Because of the fact that the bigger the district, the longer they've been around, the older the equipment. So you have to be careful how you do it, how you use it, or you can shut yourself down for quite a while. So I agree we need to be in one location and make sure it's the best location because we need to give them everything they need because this is our modern era. Technology is a maximum for what we're doing today. So I guess my question is, okay, we're saying, well, maybe we can use ESSER funds, but when you think about relocating all those departments and everything there, that's going to require, I'm sure, parking lots, uh, different construction, different, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to move in. There's going to have to be modifications. Do we have any idea what that might cost? What I would recommend, Ms. Brown, is uh, I don't have a cost available at this time, but if we get um, these, this board to agree that that's, let's start exploring this, the next step would be 
working with our technology team to explore this, to look at the parking, and then bring back and say, okay, this is what we're looking at. We just did not want to move forward without this board knowing what the intentions and the plan was for the district. I think we'd all like a state-of-the-art technology center and the training room part I like a lot because we do need training and uh, we need that facility but we would want it to look nice and and uh, really be a, a state-of-the-art facility and I'm just I'm curious what that would cost for us Mr. Nholsak is there a way that you can do like a based on the present building that is there is like a, a, a design plan or you just kind of like a design on how it would look like uh, Obviously, the utilizing the the space that is there, like perhaps a library and and the cafeteria can be used as meeting rooms, like for trainings. But then the other classrooms can be um, uh, computer labs as well as they're gonna have to move everything over there, correct? Uh, and rewire. Don't the they have whole a system. gym also? Mm -hmm. Don't they have a nice gym? That they, they have a nice use? gym also, yes, but they do. we do need kind of like a design of. Uh, of how well, the well architect yeah let's get uh, mr. Fisher to get with him and that way mr. Fisher can address uh, what he envisions for the technology department that way uh, mr. Hinojosa will have a, an idea as to what to design we can that would definitely <laughs> free up some other places for other for other departments and things anybody else Oh, Dr. Trevino. I'd, I'd like to see if curriculum can also engage in those conversations because we would like to have input as far as what resources we may need for staff development. Yes. Yeah, let's look at it and see what we could do. And we certainly want it to look much nicer than that facility down the street does. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, I, it's no secret. I think everybody knows Rosaka is near and dear to my heart. Um, so this is bittersweet. I even had my watch remind me to breathe. Um, but my biggest concern is I don't want the campuses that close to crumble down. So I'm glad that the conversations are finally being had uh, on what we're going to do with these campuses. Um, obviously, it's not what I really want in my ass water, um, but I'm glad to see something's going to happen. Oh, and I did actually have a question. Uh, I noticed that it said ESSER pending approval. So does this mean that it won't happen if, if we can't get it through ESSER? It means it'd be harder. Uh, it, it would be more difficult. Uh, basically, what it boils down to is the cost of I anticipate that this would be in the range, I'm just throwing it out there, over $5 million, I, perhaps even more. So it would make it harder, yeah, because then it, it would come out of our own funds. But is it doable? If, if it's ESSER approved, uh, obviously it would be a big help for us. It'd be good to upgrade Rosaka and turn that into a nice facility for training and for technology that would be I think beneficial I think at the end of the day uh, especially if they can make it work you know we'd hate to have somebody there that that can't make it work um, uh, but again my concern is just that something be done with these campuses so they just don't crumble away the beauty of Rosaka is it's just so centrally located and the access to the expressway and everything. I mean, it's really a wonderful little campus. It really is. So, Mr. Fisher, curriculum, and Mr. Hinojosa, you all have a project to work on. And if I may, Ms. Pena. can we make sure that we do uh, the writing and for the SR3 to make sure that we can get it done because it is going to be very important and crucial for the education of our children, our staff to get out there and get our children on the right track. So I don't see them saying that we can't. And, and like I said, state of the art, you know, you've heard the saying in our culture, that that is cheap ends up costing you twice as much. And that that's a little lazy ends up working twice as hard. <laughs> so let's do it right the first time and go state of the art. 
because it's something that's very necessary. I would like to thank the board for uh, allowing us to, to start evaluating and move forward. I do think this would be a great initiative for our district. So thank you for allowing us to begin that process. The next item, uh, I know that one of the things that we'd like to do is give you budget balances on what we are, uh, how much we have and what we're doing. So the first uh, budget that you have there is Fund 188, which is a tax rate increase. I highlighted some of the work that's being completed, and you can see an amount remaining, but we also talked about, for example, the egress that we're going to cover, the Pullum Canopy. So to say the least, let's just zero that account out, because once we finish those projects, we will have zero the money will be used completely there. The next budget is uh, budget 189, which is the maintenance tax note. You can see that this uh, budget is zeroed out. One of the things that this board asked was at the far right uh, to add a column of percent expenditures or the, sp the, the percent uh, spent. And you can see that almost everything is spent. There's a few items that are still pending, but it's at a 5% rate. So almost, uh, but all the funding is spent. It was allocated for these projects and it, um, it will be at zero balance. The next budget is a tax rate election, the TRE, and you will notice that um, the it, there's a veterans memorial, the restrooms that is happening there, and it's pretty much zeroed out also. So the facilities monies that we have in the district that were allocated either through one, one of these funds have been allocated and will be spent completely on the projects that it was intended to do. So what I'd like to do is uh, share a little bit about some unfunded projects. And what I mean unfunded is that today we don't have the funding doesn't mean that we can't find some funding in the future. But one of the things that's very, very important is the uh, Margaret Clark Aquatic Center. As you know, we just went through some uh, major repairs in the Aquatic Center. It is a very, very expensive investment. So one of the things that we're recommending is to secure uh, a quarterly maintenance plan that we the boilers are checked the pumps are checked filters are checked and so forth we're asking an allocation of a hundred thousand for the year we do not think it's going to take that much but we want to have it there in the event that we need to and this would be regular maintenance so that we don't disregard it and then be in the same situation that we were this year where we're going to have to replace and do some major replacements so we're recommending that for next year's budget we add this allocation for the maintenance and upkeep of the aquatic center Question. miss Pena. give me the details on the difference between your first uh, the secure the four years with a thirty thousand, as opposed to the total approximate of a hundred thousand a yearly budget. What is it with those two? Yes, one of the things that um, I was, I had the conversation with our maintenance team that is going to continue with the upkeep on this. Uh, the pumps and so forth, the new boilers are going to be checking all that. But let's suppose there's uh, some greasing, for example, that they have to drain the entire pool and there's some bearings that need to be replaced. There's equipment that may need to, like the bearings that are old that need to be replaced. So it may include some equipment. So that's what the uh, additional allocation is. It's inclusive of the 30000 So it's included in the 100000 there. Okay, but it says uh, it's a total of 30000 for the four years where the approximate system yearly is 100000 Yes. So that's it what's throwing me off, that it says 30000 for four years, you divide 30 by four, and at the bottom it says 100000 per year. So that's Yes, and, and I apologize because that's probably the, the way I stated it maybe was not the best way to do it. The 30000 the the, is for the four years, and that includes all that information, all the what is listed there. Then the 100000 we would be 70000 left for any equipment that is needed and so forth for the year. And that 30 is included in the 100. Thank you. I think it's, it's just a way I think I we can it. all agree that swimming pools are expensive and mm -hmm. um, they're high maintenance. They are. And um, it's a wonderful luxury. And we have it. And now we have to maintain it. And we can't get into the situation like we did this last time where we had to pour quite a bit of money into it. We'd be better off if we spent a little bit every year on it. The next item that I have, there we go. As you know, uh, we talked about the gyms and we talked about how we're adding offices, restrooms, uh, storage area, and AC, which is 
the most important thing, especially here in South Texas. One of the things that we would like to do is uh, try and use our ESSER funds and allocate it because we can use the gym as a multi-purpose room, not just as a gym. Let me explain what that may look like. The multi-purpose room could include, for example, uh, our needs, our special needs students, if they're having uh, therapy, some sort of therapy, and they may need a, a larger location to, to do it instead of a classroom. They can use the gyms to do that. So I think that we can uh, explain it in a way, and again, it, it's we don't know if it will be approved, but what we would like to do is to do um, VTC, which is a, a vinyl composition tile. It's durable. Uh, it is not as expensive as the wood, but it would allow us to use uh, the gyms now that will be air conditioned as a multi-purpose room. And again, our intent is to submit this through our ESSER funds. Every time we're mentioning ESSER, we're, we're pending, it's all on pending approval, just a, a reminder. See how it goes once we submit the plan. So a lot of it's going to be the use of words, language, um, to justify the use of ESSER, and then we'll find out for sure. But their definitions are pretty broad, or? Uh we, the intent of the ESSER three funding is to address the COVID pandemic and instruction. The more we can tie things to instruction and air quality, those are the two big ones. And so uh, we can tie, if we can tie the gym to the instructional piece that we do have at the elementary level, the components, and then also helping all students, I think that there's a good case to make that. Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess a couple of questions. My concerns about the, I, I like the idea of the vinyl flooring. I, I can envision awards, meetings, stuff like that going on at the gyms. Um, but my concern is, can they still be used as actual gyms, basketball, all that stuff the kids do? Yes, ma'am. There's some other options that we can explore also on flooring. Uh, there's some for some kits for gyms and things like that. But the idea is have one that has some wear, some song, some like longevity, longevity, and then also looking at making sure that it's multi-purpose for awards and for our special needs students. P PE is part of the curriculum and it's part of the instructional day. So and that is a gymnasium for you. Uh, besides all, many other things that we can do with it. Uh, with student activities and other things, but you know, uh, physical ed is part of the curriculum and is part of the instructional day. So, we believe that that alone can help us uh, secure ESSER funds for that. But, uh, but we'll see what they tell us. Go ahead. Is, is there a, obviously not right now? But is there a picture available? of the type of flooring that or just how it what would I want to like? say Miss um, Gonzalez I can certainly get some pictures to you guys um, but we are exploring some kits that are specifically for gyms at the wear and tear so we are exploring different options I've got Mr. Hinojosa who also visited some districts and we have uh, what they used so that we can use it uh, we also have Mr. Lopez who has done some research on the different flooring so that's something that we're going to explore to make sure that the recommendation is going to be uh, something that is useful it's got some you know we can use it for long term and it's uh, useful for all um, student populations you know come a real a long way we built these with a they were used for many years and then I remember Mr. Lopez presenting about fans and we were talking about doing fans. Now uh, we really are talking about multi-purpose buildings. I mean the, the schools just have cafeterias and those are in use all the time. This is going to be a whole addition now to the schools and it is multi-purpose. They're going to be able to do all kinds of things that they weren't able to do before because I mean it's amazing. They didn't have restrooms. They didn't have water fountains. They didn't have offices, closets, or air conditioning. And so we're really, really increasing the level of the use of those buildings. And hopefully it's going to be a real good addition to our elementary schools. 21st century. The next item that I have, as you know, we have Okay, here we go. As you know, we have a LIBOR grant in our district, and the LIBOR grant allocates approximately 100000 per campus, and it's mainly for renovations. 
lots of the money is used for upgrading furniture, upgrading uh, equipment, uh, creating some maker space. Uh, so there's a lot of instructional. It's spent on the window coverings and shelving and so forth. One of the things that we have done um, is we have provided funding out of the local account to support our LIBOR <laughs> grant through, um, you know, so that they can have that beautiful flooring that you guys have seen. That um, LVT is flooring that does not need waxing. It has a warranty of a use of about 20 to 25 years. So one of the things that we are wanting to make sure to inform this committee, the facilities, is that we have 11 elementary schools that are pending for year three and eight secondary schools. And when you look at um, what we have done this year is given approximately 25000 for each elementary so they can get their flooring done. Uh, and uh, for the secondary campuses, we've allocated about 30000 So the total budget for the year three Libro libraries would be about half a million dollars. And so this is something that we've, we've supported already for the year one and two. We'd like to continue for the year three. We've been to a lot of the openings of the libraries, and the thing that I've liked the most is that they're not cookie cutter in any way, shape, or form. Each one of them has had its own unique personality and uh, reflects the school and reflects the mascots and reflects the history of the school. I, I think it's really neat. I've really enjoyed the fact that each one's different, but special. Thank you, Mr. Barrera, to, to you and your staff. Excellent it's work. It's been... Um, a complete renovation of our libraries and each one of them has a theme that as Ms. Brown is saying and it's been very unique but uh, state-of-the-art uh, libraries that we've been having in, in our schools so it's very attractive place for kids to hang out and and be part of the of the new remodeled libraries and entice them to read more to research more on the internet and and be part of the library because the library should be the center of the campus Probably the purpose of the Libro Grants was to, uh, you know, libraries have changed everywhere now. And so they've become more of these multi, you know, purpose areas as well. And uh, it, it, I think the libraries look very 21st century now and they've just changed mm -hmm. the whole makeup of the school. It's beautiful. Nice work. The next area that I'd like to talk about is, as you know, we um, built a, a new HANA gym, and one of the concerns is that the parking that is available, currently available, is not enough parking for the size of that facility. So what we're looking at, uh, and it's a drawing that you've seen before, A, B, and C, and the recommendation from this board was to go with parking, uh, the additional parking for part A, which would be 118 additional parking. And we already have 242, so if we add the 118, that would be a total of 360 parking spaces. Um, the cost, the estimated cost, is about 300,000. This would allow to use this new facility and increase the capacity as we continue to increase the face-to-face, -face, increase the number of people that can attend and have parking available. So this is a, an unfunded project that we would like to see uh, funded for the upcoming school year. I want to remind my colleagues that, I mean, the gym is just incredible, but it fits it 200, what is it, 2,200, 2,200 people, and it doesn't have that much parking. So we've got to, we may not be able to address all the parking, but we do have to address some of the parking. The question I have as we go through this is, where are we going to get money for some of these things? Doctor, do you have some ideas? One of the things that uh, we're going to be looking at for the next three years is, uh, again, going back to the federal funds, the ESSER funds, there is going to be some approved items, a lot of approved items, especially in the area of instruction. So what we can do for the next three years is build up our general fund balance, our 199 account, because most of those expenditures that we would use a 199 to buy supplies, materials, resources for the campuses, we can... Re, uh, change the, the funding and put it through the ESSER funds and then save on our general fund, the 199. And now we save up and build up on our 199 account because we're using most of the federal funds for these other allowable expenditures that uh, we were going to have. Then we can do projects like this because our fund balance, uh, our goal is to build up our fund balance for the next three years, the 199. 
because a lot of those expenditures will be carried on through ESSER funds or federal funds. And that way we build up that fund balance and then we can use those additional monies for projects like this that uh, we are in dire need. And, and that way we could um, work it that way also. It doesn't necessarily have to be approved by ESSER like this parking lot, which we know it doesn't qualify. But we know that other programs qualify through federal funds and let's just exp use those dollars there and save on the local fund so that we can f be able to fund these this projects and, and pay for them. So that's gonna be our, our homework for the next three years is to save up as much as we can on our local fund to be able to do this type of projects. So there's, an, there's more than one way to look at this. Uh, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be paid with federal funds, but it can be paid from local funds by building up our fund balance. And we should be able to build up our fund balance because federal funds will cover so much more uh, that we were using before and now we're not gonna use local funds for that. The federal dollars will take care of that. Ms. Pena. And I agree with you because those parking spaces, especially in that open area for Hannah, especially with a new gym, is very, very detrimental to having people come in and do that. But what are we looking at as far as a timeline to getting something like this started and off the ground? Well, g give us at least a year of using federal dollars so that we can build up some fund balance. Because we have three years of using federal dollars and, and we should be able to s save a significant amount into the general fund and then be able to afford these projects. And, and I know that, that we have to kind of wait for that, but is there any other way where we can open some kind of, look at some kind of grants or something that'll help us so it'll be closer than a year because this is very detrimental to the use of the new gym, which is a beautiful gym. So if we can find some other way, let's not just wait and say, okay, let's wait for this to build up. Let's just keep looking to see if other doors open where we can get this project off the ground sooner than later. One of the things that we continue to do with uh, guidance from our superintendent is to evaluate all our funding sources. So yes, we will continue to explore. If there's an opportunity to do it earlier, we would definitely consider that. I mean, right now, my major task or our major task is to balance the budget. So, you know, there's a lot of needs that we have. And, and right now, my major need is, uh, because it's due at the end of the month, is to bring up to the board a balanced budget. So we're working with that. and. Um, and then we'll tackle on this one for the next three years as we move on. But we're okay, sir, right? We can't have the sky is falling every time because <laughs> it holds us back. I thank you for balancing the budget, but I think I see Mr. Robledo's work and he's done a very good job, so I appreciate you. Well, and, and Dr. Gutierrez. We'll do our best. <laughs> Don't be afraid. <laughs> okay, the other item that we talked about, um, that we've been talking about, I don't know if I'm having trouble with this here. I don't know if the battery's not, it's going out or something here. Okay, there we go. Now it changed it. The, I couldn't find the keyboard. Thank you. So the rebranding of the vet veteran stadium, as you know, we have a lot of great athletes in our district and the need for a second stadium to host various events, is a, it's a huge need in our district. That includes soccer. Um, and so we do have a beautiful stadium at Veterans. It has some great seating. And uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is how do we brand it, rebrand it so that it becomes a district uh, stadium. Uh, and one of the things that we would do, the the one thing that we're looking at is if you notice that this picture, there's this big M. So it would be removing that big M so that it doesn't represent only one campus, but it represents uh, for all facilities. And then that way we can uh, look at using this facility for numerous, uh, by numerous high schools and not just one high school. The cost to that is approximately $30,000. Question. Pena. So, how, you know how we have Sam Stadium? What are we looking for, forward to referring to that stadium as? Like, is it still going to be continued to be known as Veterans Memorial Stadium? Or it's going to be uh, what? You know, I like the veterans part because I'm pro always, you know, backing up our veterans in this country. So what are we looking at referring to it as? Because like Sam Stadium, so this will be what stadium? I think that once we have the funding and we have this change, I think that there could be a process. We haven't discussed the no. uh, what that name would be. Yeah, and this isn't really the, the place for that. Thank you. This is, uh, I just want to make sure when you rebrand and make sure that it's something that's positive for the community and the schools. 
The other area that we uh, definitely want to focus, you know, we've done some things for the elementary, we've done some things for the high school, and now we're looking at middle school, the track in the fields. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is we know that Bestedo uh, right now needs some repairs, but the good news is that it is under warranty. And due to the inclement weather, they just have not been able to get some of this work done. But uh, we do have the warranty kicking in here. At Vela and at Lucio, uh, some repairs have been completed, but there are some surface areas that need to be repaired. Good news, it's under warranty, so we are working with that. But then we have seven middle schools, uh, track fields, that do not have what these three schools have, the artificial turf. Um, this is a little bit of more, pr it's a little pricey. It's a 600000 each track, middle school track, if we were to make them all have artificial turf because we have three right now. We also, um, the discussion has also been the need for scoreboards for the softball fields. That's not a very expensive cost. Uh, that's about $15,000, including the windstorm coverage insurance. So these are items that I wanted to bring back with some costs so that we could evaluate and have a discussion on can't figure out some ESSER language on these, Dr. <laughs> Kunti. Um, I can consider it, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it goes back to physical activity. Uh, to it's the health of students. Yeah. Health mm -hmm. and, and uh, promoting more health. I mean, we can word it and see if they can give us approval. Um, you know. It, it's worth exploring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the only thing is with, all, with this federal funds, as you all know, it's going to be a lot of documentation, a lot of paperwork, uh, and we'll try our best to, to get as much as we can to diversify the funds into as many needs as we have. Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, th I think another thing in the future that we might have to look at uh, is turf for the softball fields just to be fair, have it fair for everybody. Way in the future. Thank you. So huge amounts of money, guys. Another question. Uh, Ms. Pena. Do we have like some kind of uh, cover like on a rainy day where we can cover the field with uh, some kind of tarp and that will help on rain? I know some schools and some people have done that. Of course, the bigger ones where we can prevent the rainy day, you know, uh, fields and maybe have something to be all the schools. The coaches could run out there and cover it. And when the rain's over, they turn around and remove it. Because you're right, it's the softball fields have all dirt on the inside of the diamond. I just like the baseball field have grass, but maybe invest in some turfs to be able to have less rain out games. So the last slide has to do with uh, just a summary of the unfunded projects. If we were to take all this out of local, which we know that we cannot do that at this time, uh, but uh, it would be at 5.9, almost a $6 million cost. I highlighted the many gyms. There may be opportunity to highlight some of the other ones through ESSER, but if we were to remove the many gyms, it still leaves us at a little bit over $5 million. So I wanted to make sure that I shared this page so that you know what, money, what amount of money we're talking about with just a few projects that we listed. Okay, this is the, the brutal reality, guys. And that concludes the presentation on the facilities. Um, I would like to thank, on this last page, you can see, um, I would like to thank um, our chairperson uh, who has been supportive with our facilities meetings. Also, all the board for making sure that you continue to support us with the recommendations that we bring forth. Uh, our superintendent, and then I won't ne list everyone that's listed there, but there's a whole team of people here uh, that have come no, in to support. List them. The, okay. Let's, let's um, thank I would like to thank Mr. Robledo uh, for uh, helping us with funding and Mary Garza, uh, Mr. Manuel Hinojosa, our district architect, 
Mr. Lopez, the maintenance administrator, Mr. Martinez Pinoza, a project manager, Mr. Fernando Villarreal as a facilities manager also, Ms. Rosie Peña in the purchasing department. Uh, we also have Mr. Corpus here also joining us or was here earlier. Coach Leal who has been helping us with the athletic director. But for this meeting I also asked for some support from our employee benefits to make sure that if there was any questions on that insurance for the uh, tank um, and also for the technology piece. Uh, we also have our technology uh, administrators here. We have our principal from Canales and our Libro grant, Mr. Edwin Barrera. So it's truly been a huge team effort to pro uh, put a proposal like this together to bring it to you and share with you uh, some ideas. Thank you. Thank you folks for being here and for putting this together. Um, everybody good? Okay, I'm Ms. Gonzalez. Uh, real quick. Uh, I failed to mention it on the part where you had mentioned the soap dispensers, but maybe it'll fall into there. Uh, are we looking at upgrading uh, our water fountains? I know we did it for the campuses. Are we going to be doing it for everybody else? Yes, that's uh, our plan. Perfect, Correct. thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, our attorneys at law, Miguel Salinas and Baltazar Salazar, for being here. Sometimes we have legal questions when it comes to facilities so thank you gentlemen for being here uh, that being said uh, dr. Gutierrez you have next steps well I think we have the public uh, public audience comments we, we have just one person signed up Patrick Hamas he wants to talk about leaky roofs Patrick, five minutes. I won't, I won't need that long, Ms. Brown. Um, I only have uh, just a couple of comments, uh, basically one. Uh, Chairperson Brown, Dr. Gutierrez, members of the board, Patrick Hammond speaking on the behalf of Best AFT. Uh, we've been contacted by members at Pace, uh, Porter, and Hannah about leaky roofs. Uh, two of those buildings, uh, Pace, you just put a brand new multimedia center into Hannah a year ago. Uh, they're concerned that that all that beautiful work might be affected if we can't get the roofs uh, fixed up so we're just asking for you to go out and check it and if at all possible do the repairs thank you and have a good evening um, Albert Alegria <laughs> I encourage you to beat it <laughs> It's not going to happen today, sir. Thank you. Thank you for trying it. Thank you, Ms. Brown, for giving me the opportunity. Good afternoon, members of the board, members of the facilities committee, chairperson, Mrs. Drew Brown, president, Mr. Eddie Garcia, superintendent, Dr. René Gutierrez. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alberto Alegria, president of Texas Valley Educators Association and affiliated with the Brownsville Unions Coalition. As the district continues to upgrade bleachers, Please be cognizant that bleachers, renovations, and or building new facilities that, th that uh, they may meet Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA recommendations for our special needs community. Being able to access and exit a sporting event or any celebration utilizing those bleachers should have a safe, adequate, and smooth transition that invites inclusiveness and meets the ADA standards. Improving air quality phase one under the ESSER three funds is critical and important that the district gets involved early to ensure that BISD is waiting in front of the line to hire an engineering firm and start the design construction program for air quality and HVAC system modifications. Many districts in region one are jogging for position to get modifications to their HVAC systems and BISD must not take a backseat to this process because by implementing the project construction management, it ensures our employees and the students that clean air will be circulating their rooms and hallways as we start face-to-face -face instruction for the 2021-2022 school year. Maintenance plan for aquatic center. We have been hearing of ongoing projects taking place at the BISD aquatic facilities on FMA 2 and it seems to me that those facilities are always under construction. Good news though, 
that's all, that all those projects are completed. However, what I bring to the table today is, can we consider construction of a new aquatic facility around the southmost area? I know Chairperson Mrs. Brown like to see our swimming programs grow and flourish at the elementary and middle school levels. It is always a plus for board members and chairpersons of committees to encourage students' participation and be a proponent of student success early in life. The rationale for the new aquatic uh, construction is 10 elementaries, four middle schools, and two high schools in the vicinity of the southmost area for a total of 16 campuses. By adding this community facility, it will also encourage parents to learn to swim and to stay healthy by implementing swimming programs. Middle school tracks. When the first middle school track was built at Raul Bestedo Middle School, I was the athletic coordinator when construction started. We were immensely excited, relieved that we were finally getting facilities to teach track and field, and at the same time, utilize it for aerobic training like football, soccer, and any, and any other sport during inclement weather. The district must continue the path of completing the tracks at all middle schools where applicable due to landlocked circumstances. Please listen to the individuals using the tracks and their present construction defects. Thank you for your undivided attention. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe. Please go and get your COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Mr. Alegria. You're welcome, ma'am. Um, next steps, Dr. Gutierrez. Yes. <coughs> thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to everyone because we have been doing so much in our facilities and making a lot of improvements, renovations, as evident when you drive around through our district facilities. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, obviously, we talked a lot about projects that uh, are ongoing, but also projects that we may be able to be funding through uh, ESSER 3. That's where we are now uh, for the month of June and July to be able to complete the plan of action for our ESSER 3 funds and to see if we're going to get approval for some of these projects that we talked about today. If we don't, then we have the other option to save on our fund balance for the next three years and be able to fund some of these projects. So. The next steps is we'll continue to uh, work on our ESSER application and our plan of action to include these projects and, and then report back um, probably after July because we're not going to have any meetings in July that and early in August and give you an update where we are. And we should have um, hopefully some information on, on our ESSER 3 um, application by then and, and then give you an update of all the projects that uh, we just talked about especially the ones that are under construction or in the renovation phase. Thank you, Dr. Gutierrez. As long as I can remember, as long as I've lived in Brownsville, I've always loved to drive around this community. And one of the things I do a lot on weekends is drive around and look at our schools and a lot of improved last few years. I mean, we all know there's more we can do, but we're definitely making an effort to improve the looks and, the, and make our schools uh, a, a better looking facility, better looking facilities, better learning environments for our students. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Gutierrez for his leadership and Dr. Cantu for her depth of knowledge. I mean, we try to stump you, Doctor, but you, you can always, you always have an answer for us. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, Eddie Garcia, uh, Denise Garza, Minerva Pena, and Jessica Gonzalez for being here with us. Thank you. So we're adjourned.